Good morning and happy February 14th. I'm thankful that you can join us online here for our Sunday service. Today we're going to do some worship. Uh, Natalia will read the scripture for us again. And then we're going to have a marriage about singleness. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I just want to remind you that on March 1st, so that's two weeks tomorrow, we are going to have our AGM. It'll be on Zoom. We hope to be sending out an information package as soon as possible so that you guys can know what's going on and we can talk about it at the AGM. And uh, I just want to open our service today with a word of prayer and then we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are a God of love and thank you that your love for each one of us was demonstrated so clearly on the cross and we celebrate that today. We glorify you for your work of salvation for us. Um, thank you that you have adopted us into your family so that we know we have a place where we belong and it is with you forever among your people. I pray that you just be glorified in our worship today, that each of us in our homes would um, give back to you from what you have given us, what you have shown us, and give, give our love back to you in our singing, in our giving, in our living, Lord. And we just pray that um, you continue to protect our community and our church family as we go through this pandemic. Give us grace and strength and patience as we wait for um, life as we, as we knew it to return. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Let's worship together. Let's worship the Lord who is completely in control, completely sovereign over everything that's taking place. And he's calling us to worship him today. Let's join together. with my 
What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. So Lord, we thank you for this day to gather in this, this different way, but to gather and to lift up your name. God, we give you praise today. We praise you and thank you that you are the God of Jesus who is enough for our sin and came to save the world. And we thank you for this day to celebrate you, to lift you up, to praise your name. We give you thanks today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder. I bow throughout the universe display Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee How great thou art, how great thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee How great thou art I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the birds and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art, and sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art, and when I think that God his Son not sparing, Send him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died, take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart And I shall bow In humble adoration And there proclaim My God, how great Thou art And sings my soul My Savior God to me How great Thou art Thou art, and sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 32 to 40. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and think 
in how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married has never or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord in, and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. But if man thinks that he is treating his fiance importantly and will inevitably, inevitably give in to his passion, let him marry her as he wishes. It is not a sin. But if he has decided firmly not to marry and there's and there is no urgency and he can control his passion, he does well not to marry. So if a person who marries his fiance does well and a person who doesn't marry marry does even better. If a wife is bound to her husband a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. But in my opinion, it would be better for her to stay single. And I think I am giving you counsel, giving you counsel from God's Spirit when I say this. This is the word of the Lord. Welcome back. In the last couple of months, we've been talking a lot around two very big topics where the world and the gospel are in pretty profound disagreement. We've talked about homosexuality and we've talked about sex outside of marriage. And in both cases, we have this really important disconnect where what the world says is good, the Bible says is sinful. And what the Bible says is good, the world says is harmful and destructive. And in thinking of these two really important issues, um, there's a a common question that needs to be addressed that speaks into both of them, and it's this. What do we do with singleness? Those who uh, are advocating for the church to affirm same-sex relationships, they, they do it be on the conviction that if you are faced with the prospect of a life without sex, that is a life without love. That is a life that is hardly worth living. It's, it's a life that's wasted. And that's an incredibly dangerous and, and damaging claim to make because not only does it tell people who are really honestly trying to make choices that honor God and not act on their temptations that their life isn't worth living, but it's also telling people who are heterosexual who have not met the person they are going to spend the rest of their life with yet, or, or just are single, that their life is somehow uh, truncated, it's diminished, it's, it's less than it should be. And this lie hurts people in a very profound way, in that it leads them to make choices that don't do them any good and don't honor the Lord. Why do people stay in relationships that they know aren't good for them? Why do people move in with their boyfriends or girlfriends even though they don't really believe that that person is marriage material? Well, it's this fear of being single in some cases. A fear that without a person in your life to give you value, you just don't have value. Today we're going to talk about singleness because I want to kill this lie. So we are going to talk about some of the challenges of being single, then we'll talk about the goodness of singleness according to the scripture, then we'll talk about how we as a church can help singles thrive, and finally we'll talk about how you can thrive uh, if you are single. So. Let's talk about the challenges. You know what, singleness is not easy. And if you are a Christian and you're single, you have a rather unique set of challenges. And sometimes it might seem that as a community, we as the church are rather preoccupied with marriage and family. And, and you know what, that's not for no reason. Marriage is a very 
theologically important institution. It is a symbol of the gospel. Children are a blessing from the Lord and a, and a sacred responsibility. So we talk about marriage and parenting because we need to. We talk about them because people who are married and have kids need help. We need effort and instruction and support in order to thrive. The thing is that singleness isn't easy either. Singleness requires effort and instruction and support. It, it, it really does merit more empathy than perhaps we give single people. And sometimes people who me, who preach and, and we see things through uh, the lens of our own situation. And that sometimes means that we fail to provide the support that single people need. Sometimes we implicitly behave as if marriage and family are the default. And if you're not that, if you're not in that situation, then there's something wrong with you. See, on top of that, church communities, like every other community, we form social circles around things we have in common, like being married and having kids. And if you're not married and you don't have kids, it's easy to feel like you're not included. Maybe it is that we sometimes just think that we don't have much in common to talk about. One friend of mine compared it to uh, smoke breaks at work, right? If you've ever worked in a business where a lot of people smoke, you know, here's this whole group of people who go off on extra breaks to spend time together and they bond together like that. They have that space to develop a connection with one another that you don't have. And, you know, I've worked in one of those situations too. And all of a sudden you see someone who was, you know, part of the smoke break crew, they get promoted because they have that connection with the boss that you don't have. Sometimes it can feel like that is happening at church. If you're a single adult, you don't have those opportunities to be connected like married people do. So you have, on the one hand, you have those frustrating circumstances from within the church. And then outside the church, you have... Uh, a culture that sees singleness very differently, a, a culture that prizes singleness and childlessness because it prizes individuality and selfishness, to be totally honest. When you're single, you are not accountable to anyone. You're not tied down to commitments. Your power as a consumer isn't constrained by having to support anyone else. I remember when I asked someone, whether uh, a, a friend, whether or not he had kids or ever wanted kids and he said no his goal in life was to have a Porsche with a license plate that said no kids because when you are childless you have the resources that you have the money and the time to do all kinds of things that people without kids can't do our culture does not see selfishness as a sin or a problem or a vice being single from a worldly perspective sets you free from every challenge to your selfishness. On top of that, our culture does not see singleness as a limiting factor on your sexual, sexual activity. If you're married, you're limited to one person for life. But if you're an unrestricted free agent, the world is your oyster. So you have the challenges in the church, you have the challenges from culture, and then you also have challenges in everyday life. Because when you're single, 100% of all the practical needs of your home have to be borne by you. You also have to pay single occupancy charges when you go on holidays, and, and that can feel rather insulting and punitive. And when you're single, sometimes the only physical contact you ever get is from professionals who are paid to do so, like your optometrist or your dentist or your RMT. And when that's the only touch you get, when no one really ever touches you, it can feel like you are invisible, like you're a ghost and you're not really inhabiting the physical world. And more often than not, singleness is not chosen and it's not embraced as a lifelong calling. When you have a lot of life to give and you have a lot of love to give and you want to share your life with someone, but God hasn't brought you that person yet, 
and the biological clock might be ticking, it's very easy to feel like your prayers are going unanswered. And you can't help but ask, why not me? You can't help but ask, God, what is the plan here? And you ask those questions and you pray those prayers enough. And at some point, the question then shifts and it becomes, does God really care? And does God really have my best interests at heart? The notion that singleness might be a gift or that God blesses people in their singleness, it can feel ridiculous sometimes. But is it? Let's take a look at how scripture describes the goodness of being single. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, chapter, chapter 7, verse 7. The Apostle Paul says, I wish everyone was single, just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift of God, gift from God of one kind or another. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it is better to stay unmarried, just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It is very better to marry than to burn with lust. So there's a lot there, but let's just focus on the main statement he's making. He wishes everyone was single, like he is. That's a very bold statement to make. Paul embraces his singleness. He celebrates it. He thinks it would be better for everyone. And we have to ask ourselves, okay, how is it possible that Paul can have such a positive outlook on his singleness when a lot of people don't see it that way? Well, let's consider a few things. First, singleness is not incompleteness or a curse. And it's interesting that in first century Jewish culture that Paul was born and raised in, uh, and even more than in Christian culture today, singleness was not the norm. Marriage and family was the norm for men his age. There was not even a word for bachelor in Hebrew or Aramaic at that time because being married was a, seen as an essential part of being a man, a real man. Blessing under the law of Moses was thought of in very tangible, material terms. You had land, you had security, you had wealth, and you had kids. When you read the Old Testament, it is pretty evident that people saw childlessness as a sign of being cursed or uh, having your blessing withdrawn from God. But Paul doesn't consider himself accursed or incomplete. Why not? Well, Jesus was never married. Jesus never had sex with anyone. Jesus never had kids of his own. And Jesus was the most complete and whole human being that has ever existed. Jesus was the most loved and blessed by God. Think about that for a minute. Jesus was a whole, complete person loved by God, and yet he was all those things as a single man. And Hebrews 4.15 tells us that Jesus did face all the same temptations that we face, but he didn't sin. It's not a stretch to say that Jesus would have been sexually tempted. It, it is actually a heresy to say that he was not. That heresy is called docetism, and that heresy is to say that Jesus didn't inhabit everything it was to be human, but that he only appeared to be human. He only seemed human, but really, you know, temptation never affected him. He was somehow impervious to it. No, he had the perspective and the power to resist the temptation of the enemy because of, of something else. But make no mistake, he had the hormones, he had the anatomy, he had the desire for connection, but he never sinned. Why? Jesus was content and fulfilled in his relationship with God, the Father. He was whole. He wasn't lacking in anything. No one ever lived a more meaningful life because he lived his entire life in relationship and obedience to God the Father. He was fully satisfied in that. So 
in embracing his singleness, the Apostle Paul is just following in the footsteps of Jesus, which challenged the cultural norm that said that you had to be married and have kids in order to truly be blessed by God and for your life to have meaning. Second thing I want us to consider is that singleness is a gift. I realize that call, calling singleness a gift will uh, feel controversial and maybe a little offensive. And right now you might be thinking, hey, you know what? If singleness is a gift, can I please have the receipt so that I can exchange my gift for something I would like better? Uh, some of you might feel like a, in order for a gift to really be a gift, it ought to be something that you really want or something that you would choose, not something that happens to you. So why call it a gift? Well, because Paul calls it a gift. Look at verse seven. Paul says, each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. And here in the context, he is talking about either the gift of singleness or the gift of marriage. So which gift do you have? Uh, let me say something that's again, a little bit controversial, but hear me out. If you are married, you have the gift of marriage. If you are single, you have the gift of singleness. If you get married, you exchange the gift of singleness for the gift of marriage. But both are gifts and both are good gifts. Now, that might be hard to hear if you are under the assumption that being gifted with singleness should be like being gifted at, you know, playing the piano or being gifted at making Excel spreadsheets, it's something that you're naturally good at, right? And so I think there's this myth that if you're gifted with singleness, that you are just completely able to live that life with complete contentness, contentness and you have a special capacity for doing that. And if you're gifted with marriage, then you have this capacity for rocking marriage without any real issues, but that is not the kind of giftedness Paul is talking about. That's not how he's using that word gift. When Paul talks about gifts in the New Testament, they're never something we choose. And they're never something that are actually focused on us personally. Gifts are capacities for blessing the church and for advancing the kingdom of God. The, a gift is to be a conduit of God doing good things through his church. So with each gift comes these capacities to, to use this gift for good, but also the responsibility to not misuse it for selfish purposes. Each gift has the capacity to bless. Each gift comes with its own set of challenges and struggles. So being single is a challenge. It comes with the challenge of being content. It comes with the challenge of being on your own and being content without sex in your life. But Paul still sees his singleness as a good gift for the church. His singleness is one of the ways that God loves and cares for his church because in very practical terms, because he is single, Paul has no responsibilities to provide for a wife and kids or to protect them. Look at what he says in verse 32. He says, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. He's not saying that in a bad way. He's just being a real realistic here. He says in the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few restrictions as possible. See, the Apostle Paul recognizes that he has a level of focus and, and, the, and availability to meet the needs of the kingdom that others just simply don't have. 
in his missionary journeys, Paul travels from place to place throughout Asia Minor and into Europe, all the way being beaten up and jailed and shipwrecked and, and betrayed and attacked by angry mobs and exposed to all sorts of danger. And it's one thing to be willing to suffer yourself for the Lord's sake. It's another to be responsible for wife and kids and to put them in that kind of danger. See, some people are of the impression that, you know, if you are in ministry like I am, uh, you need to put the needs of, of the church ahead of the needs of your family. You need to be able to sacrifice your family for the church. Paul doesn't actually say that. Paul recognizes that family has legitimate claim. And because family has a legitimate claim, there are some ways in which single people are very uniquely gifted to serve uh, in ways that married people can't. In other words, the church is blessed to have single people. Third thing I want us to see here is that singles don't miss out. In Luke 20, Jesus says something really interesting about marriage, something really incredible. So a group of Sadducees have come to question Jesus about the resurrection. They don't believe that the resurrection is a thing and they want to show how ridiculous it is. So they ask him this, this question to try and trap him, right? They say, what do we do in a case where a woman has been married and widowed seven different times? If, if there's going to be a resurrection, whose wife is she? What do we do with that? Um, and Jesus says something that shocks them and, and everyone else who is listening. He says in Luke 20, 34, marriage is for people on earth, but in the age to come, those worthy of being raised from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage and they will never die again. In this respect, they will be like the angels. They are children of God and children of the resurrection. You catch what he's saying here? Marriage is till death do us part, but not beyond that. Uh, the destination, the, the relationship status of every believer in eternity is to be single. Marriage as we know it right now, it is only a temporary foreshadowing of the marriage that will come between God and his people. So it's only a sign. It's only something pointing towards something more real, something more complete which all of us will be included, whether you are single or married right now, all of us will be included in that marriage between God and his people. In her book, The Significance of Singleness, uh, an author named Christina Hitchcock writes, relationships in the resurrection will not be characterized by marriage. Each person will be directly related to Christ and all of the relationships will go through that first relationship in a way that we cannot fully understand now. Marriage will become outmoded and unnecessary because all relationships will be fulfilled in and through Jesus. Singleness is not a sign not of loneliness, but of perfected community. Isn't that incredible? See, when you're single, it's easy to fall into this fear that somehow, you know, you're going to pass through life without anyone ever recognizing your value, that no one will love you. And with each passing milestone of life, there's this fear that can escalate into a crisis that leaves you bitter or angry with God because you feel like you will never be loved and you'll die alone and that will be it. But nothing could be further from the truth. The truth is that right now you are loved. The gospel sets a value on you. God loved you before the creation of the world. God loved you that he gave his only begotten son for you. He has betrothed you to Jesus. He has promised himself to you as part of the bride of Christ in marriage. And he's given you a family. People often associate Christianity with advancing family values, but what they don't realize is that the gospel completely redefines what it is to be a family. A family is not just your nuclear family. A family is not just your tribe. 
In Mark 3, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, um, <laughs> Mark says something uh, incredible. He says, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his, his mother and his brothers are really alarmed by what Jesus is doing, that he's now going out and preaching publicly and he's performing these miracles. And they want to talk to him because they think that he is out of his mind. So they go and find him where he's teaching people. But uh, when Jesus, when, when they come and tell Jesus that his mother and brother are looking for him, he doesn't talk to them. Instead, he says this, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked around him and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. And this isn't by any means the only place where Jesus says something like this. It is all over the New Testament. Jesus redefines what family should be to us. It is not your blood relationships that connect you to the people closest to you. It's his blood. It's not your tribe or your community or your nationality that should be connecting you to people. It's his kingdom. And in the kingdom of God, in the family of God, we are brothers and sisters to one another. In the kingdom of God, men who never father children of their own get to be spiritual fathers. Women who never bore children themselves get to be spiritual mothers. They have a role to play. Men and women have a role to play in raising other people's children. They get to have a role to play in raising spiritual children for the Lord. So if we embrace a Christian gospel understanding of what family really is, there is no reason whatsoever why singles ever need to feel like they're missing out on having family. Because they do have family. And we as a church have a role to play in making that real, in, in helping singles thrive within this family. So let's talk about how we as a church can help singles thrive. Here are some practical ways that we can help people experience the goodness of God in their singleness. All these things flow from this truth that we are family in Christ. So first, we have to tear down the walls of blood only um, exclusivity. And this is not complicated, but it is going to be stretching for you. And what this means is this, if your fellow believers are truly your family in Christ, then what you would be willing to do for your own relatives, your own brothers and sisters, your own sons and daughters, you should be willing to do for your brothers and sisters in the Lord. So, who is with you for your birthdays? Whose birthdays do you celebrate? Who do you go on holidays with? Who do you check in on on a weekly basis? Who will you, would you help financially if they asked? Who can you call if you need help, or sorry, who can call you if they need help fixing a broken toilet? Who, who can ask you to drive them to the airport? Who, can, who has, feels like they have the kind of quality of relationship with you that they are willing to ask you to help them move? It always seems a big one. Whom, with whom do you afford the grace to stay connected even when uh, the relationship goes through uh, tough seasons? See, all of us are going to prioritize certain people in our lives. And it, if it helps, you can think of it like a, a series of concentric circles, right? So at the very center, you have your family. And then out from that, you have your close friends. Out from that, you have your acquaintances. Out from that, you have your community. And what we are being challenged with here is that if you recognize that you have family members by virtue of your mutual connection with Jesus, then you have people in that closest circle who are not your biological relatives, but your brothers and sisters in the Lord, whom you must commit to as much as you commit to your own family.
but not doing this out of pity, but simply recognizing this theological reality. Second way we can love singles and help them thrive is to simply love them where they're at. Sometimes we treat single people like they are a, a problem to be fixed. You know, just another heart in need of rescue, waiting on love's sweet charity. But that's not helpful. That doesn't bear witness to the truth that God blesses singles in their singleness. See, for a single person following Jesus and embracing the kind of contentment that Paul is talking about in Philippians chapter 4, pushing them to put themselves out there more or, or to lower their standards or, or treating them like they're lepers is really not going to help them. It doesn't help them to tell them that their present situation, being single, is just a season and it will pass, if only they will hold out for their hero. Not only is it not helpful, but the truth is that if they're Christians, they don't need a savior. They already have one. Singleness is not a disease that needs to be healed. And at the same time, we shouldn't assume that a future relationship or marriage is impossible or that they're not interest, that interested, that they're just going to, you know, continue living that way indefinitely. Being a good brother or sister to a single person means loving them where they're at on each step of that journey of, of understanding God's plan for their lives. Contentment with the present for them and openness to a future change. They're not mutually exclusive uh, ideas. And we should remember that. We should listen and pray and talk and encourage, but do our best to be wise. Recognize that as, as the Apostle James says, you know, through our words, you know, like a tongue, can bring destruction like a, a little flame, can bring uh, a forest to ashes. Um, and I also want us to remember uh, that sometimes we have this tendency to put a tremendous burden on single people to produce children for our own uh, enjoyment. You know, it is totally natural for parents to want grandchildren. Um, to, they want to be grandparents, but I feel like sometimes we put this burden on our children to produce grandchildren for us, and that makes a hard situation um, extremely challenging and painful. And we need to let go of those worldly expectations and embrace the reality that in, in living as a single person, our son or daughter may bring us spiritual grandchildren and we should want and encourage them toward being uh, spiritual parents and spiritual brothers and sisters even more than we want them to be biological parents. Third we can do, third thing we can do is to not be clicky. Now, People will always sort themselves into social groups based on what they have in common. I don't know if we ever truly uh, grow out of the usual high school tropes of, of different groups. It, the tendency is that parents with young kids, like me, tend to hang out with other parents of young kids. And seniors hang out with seniors and singles are single. And it can be very hard for a single person to connect with people who are in different life situations. Um, because when you are in a marriage or when you are a parent, it can often feel like that is all there is to talk about. That is so all consuming in your life that you don't have any shared experience with a single person on which to have a relationship. But being in the body of Christ should actually broaden our horizons when it comes to our social groups. There should be space in our bubbles for people who aren't in our usual group. Because the truth is that we do actually have something profound in common. 
actually the most important thing about us we have in common with those singles and is our identity in Christ. It is this journey each of us have of living as children of God, as singles of the uh, uh, citizens of the kingdom of God in a world that is messed up and challenges us in so many different ways. We are all on that journey together. It, and it actually works to our benefit. It works for our own good to have people in our lives who have a different perspective, uh, a perspective from outside of our own situation. It's easy for us to forget that there is more to our lives than our leisure or our career or our kids and their activities or even our marriages. But when we build our social lives around this common center of our identity in Christ, that common center actually comes to define more of how we think of our own situation. And that's a good thing for us. So we've talked about how we as a church can help singles thrive. And the last thing I want to talk about is how you as a single person can thrive um, in following the Lord. And the first thing I want to say is let the gift be a gift. Let the gift be a gift. Now, if you are single, um, there is a spiritual danger that there is no immediate check in your life on selfishness. No one is in your life to tell you what to do on a moment by moment basis. No one will make you share. No one will challenge your decisions. No one will uh, demand that you, or no one will call you out on your garbage. And it's really no surprise that our culture prizes singleness because um, you get to do all these things. You're free from all these constraints that check your, your selfishness. And that means that if you are following Jesus and you are single, you have a choice about what kind of single you are going to be. Will you be self-focused or will you be others focused? Will you be kingdom focused? I wanna challenge you if you belong to Jesus and you are single, use that singleness to bless others. Singleness does have its burdens, um, but it also does provide you with a different ability and capacity that other people who are married don't have. You do have love to give. You do have time and energy to pour into things other than selfish pursuits. So make the most of those opportunities. Maybe sometimes there's gonna be seasons where you feel like you have nothing extra to give. And you know what? That's okay, because in a genuine relationship, in a genuine family relationship, it is okay to both give and receive. And it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to rely on other people to recharge your batteries. But recognize that you have something to give. You have something to offer. You might not be in a marriage, but you can be a support to the marriages and the families around you. You can be a part of those families. You know, sometimes people complain that uh, at church we talk a lot about marriage and parenting and that if you're single and you're listening to a sermon and, and, and that preacher is talking about marriage, you have nothing, no choice but to cross your arms and tune out because it is of no relevance to you and maybe is you know intended to be personally insulting to you. But if you are a part of the family of God, that is never true. If we are all part of one body, then you have a vested interest in the health and the flourishing of other people's marriages. You have a vested interest in the good of other people's children. You know what, Monday you might be married yourself and you'll benefit from listening and, and learning from you know those sermons about marriages or other people's experience of being married, married. But even if not, right now, right here, you have a role to play in being that village that helps raise children, that village that helps hold marriage, marriages together. You might not be, uh, a biological uncle or auntie, but spiritually you can be a 
uncle or auntie to someone else's kids. One of the things I've really come to appreciate about certain Asian cultures is that uh, like when you go to India, for example, everyone who is older than you is your uncle or your auntie. And, and that actually demands a certain level of respect and care and consideration in how you treat them, even if they are not your blood relative. But there's also a, a genuine two-way relationship where there's also care and affection that comes to you if you, if you treat them as your uncle or auntie. And sometimes I've experienced that and, and come back to North America and just like wonder, why can't we have that? You know what? It's not the gospel getting the, in the way. It's not the scriptures saying that we can't have that. The gospel actually says that we are one. We belong to one another. We are a family. I think that we can do better in having those kinds of uncle and auntie relationships with one another. And, and that can be one of the ways that we allow that gift of singleness to be something truly beautiful. Second thing. I want to challenge you with is to guard your mind, right? It's easy to get caught up in comparisons. If you watch romantic comedies, you are entertaining a cultural narrative that is not attainable to anyone, and it will do nothing but bring you pain as you just imagine or, or long for something that is never going to happen. Be careful that you don't get sucked into bitterness or cynicism or self-pity. And it's one thing to say, don't do it, but how do you not get sucked into all that when it, it feels like this unstoppable force that just wants to bring you down? Well, the way that you fight those toxic attitudes is to be in communion and in fellowship with the Lord, to be in the word, and turning those, those thoughts that could easily, self, uh, easily spiral into self-pity, but instead turning them into genuine prayers of lament. Do you know what the difference is between that self-pitying self-talk is and, and, and prayer? You know, in, in, when you're in self-talk, you obsess over all the ways that you've been wronged. You focus on your pain and you think about all the deficiencies of character and all the people around you, that they are not giving you what you deserve, that they are not loving you the way they should. And, and it's easy then to really get dragged down by that. But in lament and in genuine prayer, you can still be honest with God about what you're feeling, but you allow yourself to be loved by God. You invite him to show you his goodness. You invite him to lift you out of that hurt. And you also invite him to help you to see things differently and be gracious to the people who maybe have hurt you. You invite him to show you more than you're currently able to see about your situation. And that leads me to my last challenge, which is to have grace for people who don't understand your journey. Have grace for people who maybe don't recognize the struggle of being single. Um, when Steph and I moved out to Saskatchewan 12 years ago, we were the only couple at this, in the seminary community there that did not have kids. And we were just then adjusting to the already hard realities of being in a new community, in a new place, not knowing anyone, but then it seemed like every social event and every social connection that people had with one another was all built around having kids and, and having families. And that made us feel like outsiders. And I can tell you from our own experience, when you feel like an outsider, it's very easy to tell yourself that they are doing it to hurt you. They are doing, they are excluding you because of some, something bad, something ugly in their character. And that's causing them to treat you like you're invisible. But once you decide that those people are bad people for excluding you. 
then you get sucked into this cycle where, okay, you've decided they're bad people and you decide that you don't want to hang out with them anyway because they're bad people. And so you're going to isolate yourself and you're stuck in this cycle, uh, this self-perpetuating cycle of isolation. And you know what? That, that place of isolation is wonderful if you really want to feel like you're better than everyone else, but it gets pretty lonely and it's not a good place to be. The only way that you can avoid getting caught in that cycle is if you have grace for other people. So without grace, genuine community is impossible, but with grace, you're open to seeing things differently. You're open to overlooking other people's wrongs, perhaps even that they didn't intend, but then you can actually have a relationship with you. Without grace, it is impossible for you to thrive as a single person or a married person. But the good news is that as God's people, we have been given unlimited resources of grace. We have been given grace so we can show grace. We have been given love so that we can show love. We've been adopted into a family so that we can be a family. So if you are single, you are not cursed. You are not overlooked. You are not stuck without a place to belong. You are loved and you are gifted for God's kingdom and God's glory. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you um, for your love for each one of us. And I, I pray for those uh, in our family who are single, Lord, that they would be open to seeing the ways that you bless them in their singleness right now and are also blessing the church and growing the kingdom through them. Lord, that they would live not for themselves,